Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, this is Matt Rigney with the Collaborative for Educational Services, and this is workshop number one, Meet the Pro. And our guest today is Dr. Juan Jimenez. Um, I'll give you a quick, simple introduction on Dr. Jimenez. He is an assistant professor of the Dar Department of Mechanical and Industrial Engineering at the University of Massachusetts. He received his uh, bachelor's in science degree in mechanical engineering from Michigan State University and an MS and a PhD in mechanical and aerospace engineering, for engineering from Princeton. His PhD work focused on turbulence, conducting the highest Reynolds number of wake measurements ever concluded. He transitioned to the University of Pennsylvania's Institute for Medicine and Engineering as a postdoctoral fellow to study the effects of fluid flow on implantable biomedical devices and vascular biology. He also served as a faculty member in the School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania before moving to UMass. His research focuses on experimental cardiovascular biomedicine, specifically addressing the interaction of fluid flow in the blood vasculature and lymphatic system. He also works in the area of biomedical implantable devices like stents and the role of forces on bone mechanotransduction signaling. He, re he received a GEM Foundation sorry, a GEM Fellowship and a Ruth L. Kirchstein National Research Service Award. He is also a dual recipient of the prestigious NIH K-25 Mentored Quantitative Research Center Development and NSF Career Awards, and has also been awarded the Biomedical Engineering Society Innovation and Career Development Award. So I'd really like to welcome Dr. Juan Jimenez. So Juan, can you unmute your your microphone there. Sorry, thank you. Thank That's you for okay. that great introduction. <laughs> no problem. Um, and do you have a camera on your computer? Yes. Sorry. Let me. That's uh, okay. We'd love to see you. Let me find. Uh, it is okay. Maybe I have the wrong camera selected. Let me check. Yeah. Uh, that, that. Settings. There you go. All right. We awesome. have you now. Awesome. <laughs> great. Well, thank you for joining us today. It's great to have you. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, so I, we have a bunch of high school students here from around the valley. Um, sure. They've done a great job in the first two workshops that I've run on writing resumes. We've got a whole workshop series planned on sort of the creation of documents mm -hmm. uh, for applying for professional positions and internships. But part of what I wanted to do, along with um, helping them write those documents was to begin the whole process of interviewing uh, and introducing them to professionals in the STEM fields. Um, and I know last year you were a host site for one of our STEM at Work students. Um, and we'd really love to hear, for example, uh, how you got here and, and sure. what do you do? What's your area of focus? And we can just kind of roll the conversation from there. Absolutely. So, um, at, in my, one of my previous positions when I was a, at the University of Pennsylvania, um, I was working at the medical school. But in addition to that, I also served as a faculty fellow in the residence halls. And what that meant is I lived in the dorms. I did that for almost eight years um, and shared my life with 18 through 22-year-olds. Uh, and uh -huh. we did that. And it, and it was amazing. Great. And one of the things that I did when I lived there is I would ask, and I'm gonna answer the question, I would ask the faculty, I would have faculty come into the residence halls and ask them the following question. I would tell them, would you be so kind to explain to us how you got from, let's say, high school to where you are right now? And the reason I always asked that question was because many times when you're 16, 15, you think you need to know what you're gonna do when you're 30, 35, and what was funny time after time, it's pretty much that the faculty, when they answered the question, you would see that the their career trajectories were never linear, were yeah. always very tortuous. They would just go, they would say, oh, I found this and I was interested in that. Then I followed that. And then I followed this other path. And then eventually they would make it to where they were. Yeah. And that's what you're going to hear from my um, career track. So when I was in high school, um, I was really interested in how things worked in mechanical things. And I said, all right, what would be a career that will help me satisfy that curiosity? 
And I said, all right, I'll go into engineering. I'll go into mechanical engineering. And that's what I did. So I went into mechanical engineering. And I was taking the classes, doing well. And one thing I did, and this is something that I, I this is what's so great about this program that you get to do an internship. Um, during the summers, I actually uh, went and worked in, um, in internships. And I interned in industry in 3M company in Minnesota. And I interned with them for three different summers in different divisions. And it was, it was an amazing opportunity to be uh, still not with an engineering degree and actually doing engineering work. But one thing that happened, actually it was my third summer, I noticed that the type of work that an engineer would do in industry, in for example, in a manufacturing setting, it was something that did not match my personality. It was a great mm -hmm. job. Some of the engineers at the plants, they were they have been there for 20 to 30 years and they were doing amazing work. But my personality, I like for things to change every so often. Mm -hmm. And if you have a personality that you don't want things to change too much, being in a manufacturing setting, it's great because you'll get to know that plant really well and do what you want. So it's something that you first thing I, at one point I want to make is you got to know your personality and see with what type of work it all fit. And so I said, you know, I don't want to be doing this for the rest of my life. So I'm going to go to graduate school. So I, at that point, I decided to apply to graduate schools. and. Uh, one thing that I'll suggest now for going from high school to college, and then if you go further beyond, is to apply, I would suggest to about seven different universities. And um, and, and, and then you got to think about uh, in terms of uh, the criteria that you have to come up with a criteria that will be um, uh, acceptable to you. But one of them will be universities that you would really want to go there. Others that you're sure that you'll get in, but it also you will not mind being there. And then also the third uh, tier will be those that for sure you know you're going to get in. So when I was in my third year, after doing the internship for three years, I applied to graduate schools. I applied to seven different graduate schools. And then from those seven, uh, I decided to go to uh, Princeton University in New Jersey. And um, so I went there and I started studying fluid mechanics. So fluid mechanics, when I was an undergrad, I took a class that it was really, really hard, but I just loved it. And it was the, this course essentially describes, like if you want to know how an airplane flies, or you want to understand the physics of, let's say a baseball being thrown, or you want to understand how a ship or submarine goes through fluid, through water or bird flying, this is what fluid mechanics is. It's essentially the physical laws that describe movement through fluids. So I, I, I was really excited when I took fluid mechanics as an undergraduate student. And I said, I want to do that for the rest of my life. So I go to a graduate school. And first, think about when I was 15, 16, I had no idea what fluid mechanics was. Now I'm an undergrad. I find out, hey, fluids is awesome. Then I go to graduate school, and that's what I want to do. So I'm doing fluid mechanics doing uh, some very interesting work we were, I was learning a lot. Um, we were, I was working different projects, some projects we were trying to understand how to mimic how fish swim to make vehicles that actually can mimic that motion. Uh, we were looking at flow similar to what you would see in like the space shuttle as, as, as it's uh, in re-entry, so supersonic flows. So it's doing a lot of fun work. And then one year I was at a conference for fluid mechanics and there was a speaker and the speaker was talking about fluid flow in the body. So if you think your body, your body has blood, has air in the lungs, different fluids. And the speaker was talking about how fluid flow in the body actually can play a role in disease, in the development of diseases. Mm. And I was like, wow, that is fascinating. I want to do that. <laughs> so at that point, I said, all right, I'm going to switch again my career path. Wow. So at that point, I decided to apply to the um, University of Pennsylvania, to the medical school, to do a postdoctoral fellowship. And what you do in a postdoctoral fellowship, so this is after you finish your doctoral degree, your PhD, you can go and do research under the supervision of a professor. And at this point, it's, um, it's a transition period where you're starting to become more independent. You're learning how to, if you want to become a professor, you're learning how to do this. So I went to the University of Pennsylvania, 
medical school. Now, remember, all my degrees have been in fundamental engineering. So math, equations, physics, no biology. So, uh. <laughs> so I started doing that. And then I find out, huh, I need to learn about biology because there's a lot of biology here. So uh, what I did, I said, all right. I know what I need to do. I need to go back and take classes in biology. So as a postdoctoral fellow, uh, I had not taken classes now for years. I went back and I started taking uh, cell biology, molecular biology, biochemistry, vascular biology. And it was intimidating because I hadn't taken biology in years. I'm taking biology courses with students that are like in uh, our undergrads in their sophomore, junior years. And they're doing, you know, they, they've taken biology just a year or two before, and I haven't taken any biology, so I had to work a lot harder. But I did that for about two and a half years. And at the end of that, I felt a lot more confident that I had the knowledge, the necessary knowledge to uh, be able to ask interesting questions where I could use the, my background in fluid mechanics and engineering with my new background in biology and then bring these two fields together. I'm, what I'm going to tell you about this, um, it's actually, it's very challenging for you to do interdisciplinary work, that you bring in different fields, bring them together. But although it's very challenging, to me, I found that very interesting because you can ask questions that other people that have a degree in just one field cannot answer. So that, you know, that's one challenge that you have to keep in mind. But then based on that, I started studying uh, how fluid flow in, for example, your blood vessels, how depending on where you are, um, you can actually, the flow, the blood flow in your blood vessels can change. And what's interesting is if you know a little bit of fluid mechanics, you can look at your arteries in your body and you have a good idea of where you're going to develop atherosclerosis just by no knowing fluid mechanics, because actually the fluid mechanics just based on about how the blood flow uh, behaves, will give you an idea of uh, where disease is going to develop. And so I started working in that area. And what was fascinating is we would do experiments where you would take cells that have been isolated from a blood vessel, and we would conduct an experiment in vitro in, in a laboratory, and we would simply stimulate them with fluid flow. And then after the experiments, we look at RNA, we look at proteins, and just by changing the fluid flow of those cells, you can completely change how the cells, their phenotype, to make them more either protective or increase the risk towards disease. And, I, it, it, and it, to me, that was fascinating. And I said, all right. So I was in my postdoctoral fellowship and I said, all right, I want to continue doing this as an actual university professor. So, um, I did that, and so I stayed in the medical school a few years as a faculty member, and then decided to uh, move uh, somewhere else. At that point, we had uh, young kids. We were living in the city. We wanted to move somewhere else, and I was applying to universities throughout the country and ended up at, at UMass. And now in UMass, essentially, that's what I, uh, I'm doing. I, um, I have a laboratory. In, uh, in, a, in a building that is the life science laboratories. And in that building, there are people with many different backgrounds and we're all doing different type of work. Uh, so you could go to the laboratory next to mine and there's someone studying bone disease. The person next to my other uh, lab, they're looking at uh, how mechanical forces on cells, like you would expect, for example, um, a muscle that is moving or, or, or some other tissue, uh, they're looking at how that can affect uh, diseases or development. There's another lab, someone working on bacteria. So I'm in a building where people, they're working on very different topics, but we can actually collaborate and talk about our research and our work. So in my laboratory right now, just to give you an idea, um, I have undergraduates, graduate students, and postdoctoral fellows. And each of them works on a different project. They have different backgrounds. So I have students that are engineers. I also have students that are biochemists. So you see people with very different backgrounds and working in the same laboratory. And in the laboratory, what we're interested in is how forces, so again, I have not abandoned my background in engineering. 
So we look at how forces actually play a role in affecting cells or animals. We have a project where we use fish um, and how that causes changes, be it in disease or development. Um, and, uh, and some of the diseases we looked at are related to heart disease. Uh, we have a new project that we're just starting where we're looking at uh, how blood flow is potentially affecting the uh, blood vessels in the brain. So you probably have heard of people that have suffered from a stroke um, in, in the brain. And the reason that can happen is two different reasons. Either you get a blood clot or you get a blood vessel, blood vessel that breaks and then releases blood to the uh, tissue and it starts to cause damage. So in my lab, we're interested in how do these aneurysms, which are bulges that form in the arteries, how do they form and how, why do they break? And so when, you're, when we start with a project, many times we're wondering, uh, so we don't know the answer to the problem. So what we do is we start with our background. And uh, what we're right now hypothesizing is that we think that the blood flow characteristics, how the blood flow is behaving in some patients, it actually causes them to um, be more susceptible to an aneurysm. So I have a scientist in my laboratory that he's looking at the blood flow. Right now, I'm hiring someone else that he's going to be looking at cells. What happens to cells when they're exposed to the blood flow? Do they start making proteins that make them more susceptible to the disease? And uh, when we answer, and then at the same time, we're working with a neurosurgeon that he provides us data on patients that actually have aneurysms. So you see, we, we can bring all these different uh, data together to try to understand uh, a, a basic problem. Um, another uh, project that we have in the laboratory is, uh, we, and this is a new one, and again, uh, one thing that you, you I, I tell my students and my trainees is that, you know, if you're, if you're flexible, you know, your career can take you to very interesting places. So um, about a year ago, uh, a student uh, was doing her PhD in my department and her uh, supervisor left to another university. And she and I had been helping her with her experiments. And she asked me, you know, if I was willing to be her supervisor. And I said, sure. Well, the challenge was the student was working on uh, how forces play a role in uh, bone and bone diseases. And I have no experience in bone, but I understand fluid mechanics, I understand forces, and I understand the biology, so I said, sure. So what has been very interesting out of that project, a student that needed a supervisor, she approached me. Now we're using zebrafish, which are these very, very small fish, and we actually are looking at these fish and we put them in a, in a water channel and the water channel is similar to a wind tunnel. Uh, and what we do, we have a pump that has these fish exercise at a higher rate than they normally would if they were just in a fish tank, just passively moving around. And we have that group of fish in, a, in the water channel. And then we have another group of fish in the fish tank and we know that the ones in the water channel are exercising harder. So then after a week or so of this regimen of exercise, we look at their bones. Are their bones bigger? Have they changed? And what's amazing is, is that you see these fish after a week of exercising harder, you see that their bones become uh, larger. Reemphasizing, yeah, reemphasizing that, you know, they tell us, hey, you got to exercise so that your bones are stronger. Yes, that's actually true. How do you, so, so in, in a case like that, how do you measure, how do you possibly measure in a small fish the changes in bone over a week time? Yes. So what we do, we, we have different approaches. Uh, one approach that we tried is using a CT. You probably heard of CT scans that mm -hmm. they conduct on, on patients. And they, they use x-rays essentially to uh, take images of the bone. And then you reconstruct it. And then you can measure. If the fish are too small, it's very difficult to do. So then the second way that we do it is at the end of the experiment, this fish is sacrificed. And then we use special uh, dyes 
that will uh, change the color of the bone. And then we can measure the bones, take images of the bones and see how they have uh, changed in size. And we measure it and then we can know that the uh, bone has increased in, in growth by you know 10%, 20%, depending on, on, yeah, on the animal. Yeah. Fascinating. <laughs> yeah. So I'm wondering at this point, Juan, I'm wondering if we yeah. can just see if there's any questions that come sure. up among, among the students and then we yeah. can go back and maybe dig a little bit more into the sort of research that you're doing. Absolutely. And, you know, I have some career related questions for sure. you about what does the future look like for somebody sure. using biomed engineering sure. and uh, stuff like that. So, but I'd like to open the floor at this point to see um, if there are any other questions among among the students. I'd love to hear what just what your curiosity is at this point. Uh, I have a question. Aisha, go right yes. ahead. Um, was it tough for your family moving around so much? Mm. Yeah, that you know that's a really good question. So, um, so f first, so it's in, you know it's a uh, it it's a great question. I'll tell you why. Uh, so both my wife and I both we went into higher education. So my I, you know I went through engineering, then uh, biomedical, and my wife actually uh, went after she finished her undergraduate, she did a dual degree. Uh, so she's a veterinarian, but in addition to that, she also did a PhD in microbiology. Uh, so she got a PhD and a VMD. Um, what was interesting about that is that, you know, we got married when we were still students and actually it made it very useful because we kind of understood each other. So when I was studying, she was studying. And so that aspect made it easier where we had friends where, you know, one of the spouses was actually was still studying while the other one had already graduated. And sometimes a little, there could be a little bit of resentment because, you know, the one that was not studying, they were like, hey, you know, um, why are you so busy studying? So in our case, it's actually uh, worked out well. Um, but it, it, you're absolutely right. It was a little bit tricky with the moves. And many times what makes it hard is that, um, you don't know where you're gonna end up because uh, when you're applying as a student to a university, you know, pretty much every year, every university has a number of seats that can be occupied by, you know, some number of students. But the higher you keep going up in terms of your studies, that number of, of, of openings, it changes. So like when you go into graduate school, it may be that the person that you want to work with that year, they don't have an opening. So that means you cannot go to that university. That means you got to go somewhere else. And then after you finish that uh, year, like when I went to the postdoctoral fellowship, then it's even even more limited because then there's only, you know, limited positions in the, in the whole country. So many times there's this ambivalence, especially when you're in a relationship, you're like, well, no, is there going to be an opportunity for both of us? And uh, what will happen is that, you know, there there's some um, uh, universities, for example, that actually make it uh, relatively easy and they they help you in terms of finding uh, a job for your for your spouse or, or your companion. Um, they're, they're really good about it. Uh, but, you know, it makes it tough sometimes because, you know, you move, you leave friends behind, you got to start, start again. Uh, you got to make new friends, uh, especially when you have uh, young children. And as they're getting a little bit older, uh, older it's a little bit harder because then, you know, you got to move and then they, you know, th their friends are not there. Uh, so you're absolutely right. These are challenges that, um, uh, you know, that you deal with. And, and you get to a point that you have to weigh that, you know, what's, you know, how important it is. Um, you know, a geographical location versus career and all these things. And these are all very, very important considerations that you have to um, uh, work on. Yeah, and those sorts of things will come up in a lot of different careers. Yeah. Um, yeah. How about some other questions? Uh, what advice do you have for people who are like in high school and like we know we want to go into STEM and we have sort of a narrow-ish idea of what we want to do, but we don't know like what specific field yet. Yes, that, you know, that's a great question. Uh, I, th this is my opinion, the following. 
the mm -hmm. decade between 16 through 26 years of age, I, I think it's, it's one of the hardest decades of your life. Why? Because, you know, you're deciding like, you know, where you're going to go to school, uh, what career you got to choose, potentially who's you're going to be your life mate, uh, where you're going to live. And it's all these decisions that you got to make in about 10 years that essentially are going to affect the rest of your life. And, you know, I don't mean that, uh, you know, to emphasize the stress. So, you know, I don't mean it that way. But um, uh, what what I always uh, suggest is, in, in, you know, and it's very tricky because, when when you're 16 and and even later many times you don't even know uh what you may find interesting until you run into it so let's say for example you say you know i really like um biology or i really like uh, physics and you start doing it but there could be another field in neuroscience that you never heard of or you never been exposed to it that if you got into it you would love it and the challenge with that is to uh, be flexible. And then uh, when you're applying, just to uh, not just focus on the field that you're working on, but also uh, take classes in other fields. And why? Because let's say, for example, you say, oh, you know, I really enjoy physics. Uh, well, just not only uh, focus on physics, but also look at other uh, fields. Maybe take a class in biology, may, uh, some others in, in humanities, some in engineering, um, in math, because who knows, you may end up doing something else. And uh, then you find that and you're like, wow, I'm really passionate about this. I could see myself doing this. Um, and the other thing is that many times when you start the degree, there's this uh, pressure that, oh, you got to finish it in four years. Well, what about if you start your first semester and you're a physics major? And then uh, second semester, you took biology. You're like, wow, I really love this. It's possible that you're going to be behind by a semester. But in my opinion, I think it's more important that even if you're a semester, you graduate a semester later, that you're doing something that, you know, you're more passionate about. So, um, so, so just to summarize, just to be flexible and be curious to see um, what's happening in other fields, because uh, reaching that decision of what you want to do for the rest of, uh, you know, for, for some time, um, it's actually, you know, it's not that simple. And actually, I'll, I'll, I'll add something else. Um, as part of my job, I also have to advise the undergraduate students. And many times they come to me and we talk about career and all, you know, and all these different aspects. And I always tell them, especially the ones that uh, graduate and uh, are, are about to graduate, I tell them, hey, remember, if you go to work and you don't enjoy this, uh, enjoy doing uh, work, working in industry or some other field, you can always go back to graduate school in a year or two. You know, it's not the end of the world. If you go back to school, you did it a little bit different. At least you found out what you did not want to do. And I've I, and I've seen um, students that actually that has happened. They go start working in industry. After a few months, they'll contact me and they tell me, hey, what I'm doing right now, I'm not really enjoying. I want to go to graduate school. Like, great. You know, that's fine. And then we talk about uh, what they need to do to go to graduate school. So uh, just to emphasize that if you do something and you find out halfway through it, hey, I want to do something else, that's fine. It's not the end of the world. Um, yeah. I would jump in here and just add um, one that I, and this is to the whole group. Remember the soft skills we talked about in the resume development? Those soft skills are your way of connecting to other people, whether they be colleagues of yours that you're working with, peers who are going to grad school with you, professors, anybody you're learning from. If you have good social skills, those people can become sort of points in your network of people that you're connected with who can who know you and who can say like, hey, you know what, this is what I'm seeing in you as a skill set. You'd be really good at this. Or have you ever thought of going in this direction? Those kinds of experiences, um, they kind of shape your life. And they can be, they can do it in a really positive way. Mm -hmm. Yep, I agree. Um, how about some other questions? Hi, um, I kind of have two questions in one. I would love to know what a typical day or week looks like in your work, and also how much of your work is collaborative versus independent. 
Yes, great Good question. question. So yeah. if you go into academia, this is something that you should be really aware of. Um, it's more a lifestyle than a job. And what do I mean by that? Um, and this is something that you, 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 you got to really, really know uh, before you get into it. Um, so if you really enjoy your time off, if you really enjoy that, you know, let's say you're in a job and after 5 p.m. you go home and the rest of the evening it's for you and you go and you play softball, do sports and all that, um, you have to keep that in mind because if you go into academia, you're pretty much all the time on. Um, so, if, for example, you go and do your your work during the day, and then you come home during the evening, and then you're doing more work, um, and then in the weekends. Um, so, however, that said, it is very very flexible uh, type of work. So, for example, um, let's say that uh, many times I can work from home. If the, unless I have a meeting that I have to be there or um, I have to meet with my students or something like that, I can work from home. Um, so, you know, something to keep in mind. So what does my day look like on a daily basis? So in the morning, um, so, I, oh, and then something else is that, you know, as, as an, I, uh, a faculty member in, in academia, um, many times you think, hey, my professors, all they do is teach. And actually teaching is maybe about 10% of my time. So right now this semester, I, uh, I'm i teaching just one course and the rest of the time goes into research efforts and about 10% into other administrative du duties. Uh, so what happens is I, I'm teaching one class this semester, it's about 75 minutes long. Um, the first time you teach a class, it takes a lot of work to put, put a class together. And after you've taught it several times, it becomes a lot easier. And you know, when you're going to deliver 75 minutes of, of a lecture, sometimes it may take about a whole day to get your lecture together. Um, so the first time you teach it, you can see how um, you know the first time you're teaching a big portion of your day, it goes to getting that class together. Then on the side. Um, a lot of the effort goes to research. So I have students right now. I have, I think, five graduate students, one postdoctoral fellow, and two undergraduate students in my laboratory. And they're all working on different projects. So um, I'm meeting with them, following up with the research. How's the research going? Asking them about the results. What do we need to do next? Uh, so that's an, another uh, effort, uh, time effort for every day. And then in addition to that, I actually spend a lot of my time writing. So if you think that you want to go into academia, and, and I tell this to my students and students that I teach, um, like many of them say, oh, I'm going into sciences. I don't have to be, you know, inadequate or, you know, mediocre will do. And I tell them, no, writing is one of the more important skills that you're going to need. Why? Because when, like for me, I have a laboratory. A laboratory is essentially like a small business. And continuously, I am trying to convince someone to give me money so that I can conduct the research that I want to conduct. So I have to write grant proposals. And if you're in your grant proposal, you cannot communicate and convince someone that what you're studying is important or worthy of studying, they're not going to give you the funding. So um, you're, you're, you're trying to convince someone uh, with your words and your preliminary data that what you want to study um, is actually very important. So um, I know it's a very long answer to a simple question that you asked, but essentially my days, it really depends on, on the day. If that day I'm getting ready for a class, then pretty much I'll be working on the computer, getting a lecture, uh, putting a lecture together. Um, if if that day I'm working on a grant, then I'm probably working, you know, maybe 12, 13 hours in front of the computer and writing, working, uh, reading scientific articles and writing. Uh, I, students, I'll be with them in the laboratory uh, conducting experiments. Um, I go in during the weekends. Um, so it, it really depends on the day and the number of hours are definitely not an eight, to five type of job. It's definitely a lot longer. 
that's a good way to put it that it's more of a lifestyle than uh, mm-hmm. than a nine to fiver. I think mm-hmm. you know there are a lot of jobs that are like that. Yeah. Um, but the trade off in flexibility is sometimes yeah. what people really like. Yeah. So to the students, that's a really it, it's so important to know yourself to know what is it that you want out of a job. Um, not just in terms of income, but in terms of benefits and in terms of those other lifestyle features. Some people, uh, for me, for example, I just cannot do a desk job. I can't go in and just be sitting at a desk day in, day out, working in an office. It would it would kill me. Um, and luckily, I work for an employer who understands that. Um, so let's see if there's other questions that folks have out there. I have one if, if nobody wants to jump in. Um, um, you know, I always try to address some of the real world topics with students. Um, for example, like how do you make a living? There are some jobs that they're fun, they're interesting, but they don't pay you enough to actually pay for rent and food and everything else. You you went through a lot of schooling. Mm-hmm. Um, schooling costs money. Yep. And uh, so I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, how does a professor make money in addition to his or her salary? What kind of educational costs are you looking at? And, you know, et cetera. I'll leave it up to you. Yeah, absolutely. And and I'll start. So in, in the next year or two or so, uh, a lot of you are going to be making decisions about um, what university to go to, what university to attend to. And this is uh, my opinion. I think that it's more important for you to graduate with as little debt as possible than the name of the school. And this is coming from someone that has uh, went to state schools, Ivy League schools, uh, prices, uh, the, the cost is very different. Uh, and I'll tell you why. I have friends that when they graduated, they graduated essentially with a mortgage because the amount of uh, loans that they had after doing an undergrad, then going to professional school, and then doing residency, for example, they ended up with about you know two hundred, two hundred some thousand dollars in debt. Uh, and uh, in my opinion, this is something that you got to keep in mind uh, because depending on um, how much debt you have, that is going to limit your career options in the future. So. Uh, what does that mean? That if you owe a lot of debt, then you probably are going to be uh, motivated more by a job that pays a lot more because you got to pay back that, uh, the, the debt. So that's one th- thing to consider as you're deciding um, for um, uh, schooling. And uh, so when you go into graduate school, unless you're going into a professional field, let's say like you're doing like an MBA or law school, or medicine, or some of these. In general, graduate school, uh, it's paid for you. You will get a stipend. Uh, and this is if you're doing a PhD. If you're only doing a master's, then it's rarely paid for. So um, you can sometimes get scholarships for master's, but it's very limited. If you're doing a PhD, you will get a stipend, and your tuition and fees and all the other costs will be covered. So. Um, uh, you're not going to be rich, but you'll get a stipend that'll be sufficient to pay for, you know, apartment, meals, and so on. Um, and then, uh, let's say, for example, when I did a postdoctoral fellowship, you're, you're paid a salary. It's, it's, it's not very much, but again, it, it's sufficient to, uh, to be able to pay for your meals uh, in the apartment and so on. And then when you go into academia uh, as a, to work as a professor, you, you don't go into it because of the money. Um, if you're really interested in the money, I have friends that, you know, they went to work into industry. Um, I actually have friends that I have a, one of my colleagues when he, we did our PhD, when he finished his PhD, he said, this is the day that engineering and I part ways. And he, <laughs> he, he went to, he, my God. <laughs> so he went to work for uh, Wall Street. He went to work for a bank. And you say, wait a minute, how can an engineer w- go to work in Wall Street? Well, the reason is because Wall Street likes to hire people with, in the STEM fields because they like to uh, people that can create mathematical models to anticipate what the market is going to do and understand. And for someone to be able to do that type of work, they need a very strong um, um, like STEM uh, background. 
and uh, they will hire those type of folks, and those folks get paid a lot of money. So you know, it, so if if money is a motivation for you, then probably academia is is not the place to go. But then again, you're not gonna be poor. Um, you know, it it uh, in academia, the university will pay for nine months of your salary only. They do not pay for the summer months. And then the summer months, what we do, we actually have to raise our funding to pay ourselves. So for that, uh, that's when I'm writing grants. As part of the grants, I have to include a uh, salary for myself. So, um, so if I don't have uh, grants, then I cannot pay myself in the summer, but I'm still working. So this is something that you have to think about. Then something else that you can also do is as an academic, the university allows you to consult uh, one day out of the week. So you can uh, consult for companies if you want to. And actually, I have a lot of companies reach out to me that uh, they're looking for an expert in a field. And, um, and you know, they, they pay you per hour. Normally, for something like that, instead of doing it as a consulting job, I'll just have them fund my laboratory so I can pay for my students. And then we, we can take on um, uh, site projects. So right now, I'm consulting for two different companies, and they make uh, biomedical devices that are implanted in the brain. And uh, so with those folks, I have uh, they provide uh, funding that then I use to pay for my students and so that they can do uh, conduct research. So I, again, uh, uh, you know, this is something that you got to think about. Um, you're, you're not going to be uh, poor uh, in terms of if you decide to go into academia. But then again, you're not going to be uh, extremely rich unless unless and i know this uh, i know people have done this that as part of their research they have been able to patent discoveries and then those discoveries um then uh they uh they submit a patent and then a company comes and buys the patent from the university or licenses it and then in those cases then you see some faculty that actually end up getting um a sizable amount of, of funding uh, that sometimes is either personal or goes towards the university. Um, yeah. Did that answer the question or you were thinking something else? Did, oh, did that answer the question? Was that Natalie? I, oh. I forget who answered it or who asked that question. Um, you asked it, Mr. Igni. Oh, did I? Yeah. <laughs> I thought it was Karen. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, I like what you said there, Juan, about, um, about, you know, so much emphasis is placed on which school you go to, like yes. the Ivies are the best schools. Yeah. I will, I will second what you said. Yeah. Um, I went to a good school. I went to Bates College up in Maine. It's not an Ivy League, but it's a fantastic school. And it, after like four or five years out of school, it doesn't matter where you went. It matters what you can do and it matters who you are. Um, and you know, really a lot of times people will go to those schools, they have access to funds or privileges or have connections that they just happen to get as part of uh, their path in life. But it doesn't mean that if you, if you don't go to a school like that, you're not going to be, you're not going to have access to opportunity. I think you make your opportunity um, by interpersonal connections and hard work um, and being, being motivated. Uh, it, that doesn't always make the difference. Um, but, but I think, I think getting out of school with as little debt as possible is a brilliant move mm -hmm. because it, it means that you're free to make choices that aren't related to having to make a certain amount of money. And I, I would second that. I, I'll just add one, uh, one, one point to that. I, I have a friend that because they have so much debt, they wanted to have more children and they didn't, yeah. they just had yeah. one child because they had so much debt because the, both the husband and the wife, both be amongst, between the two of them, they had like $300,000 yeah. in debt. So, yes. That's a really, really good point. It affects, it affects all sorts of decision-making in your life. Um, let's hear from some other students. Um, when you talked about like the STEM program, I'm kind of like confused, like, like if you want to go into STEM, do you have to like study like science, technology, engineering and math? Or like, can you do like other careers that are like linked to that? Like if you want to be like an accountant and then you do like math, is that like also considered as like STEM? 
Yeah. So um, it. So yes. I mean, it's a good question. So it depends. Where do you want to go in the future? Um, so if you want to go more into uh, the math field, um, you know, de definitely that. It, it it depends really on what you want to do. So for example, I was doing engineering and then eventually was able to migrate and do uh, more biological, biomedical research, biomedical engineering. It was easier to transition because I had a lot of the background that I needed. If you were doing, um, uh, let's say for example, basic math, you can, but more likely the type of research, let's say for example, if you wanted to uh, translate to uh, um, or migrate to a different field, then more likely you will be doing something like uh, uh, mathematical uh, biology or something like that. So you still can do it. You can move within the fields. Um, but if you stay in, in accounting, I don't know that much about the, uh, the courses that they take. And the, definitely they take a lot of math. Um, but I don't know if they're taking a lot of the courses that will be more like you would see in like basic math, maybe that they're they're looking at more like uh, fundamental questions as opposed to more of an applied field like accounting, that it would maybe more about accounting and accounting rules, where if you're doing basic math, maybe you're uh, learning about uh, theorems and uh, different areas in math that potentially you could more easily translate to these other STEM fields. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Juan, what would you say the future of, of your biomedical engineering industry looks like? Yeah, absolutely. So biomedical engineering is, is here's what's tricky about it. They, if you go through a, a biomedical engineering degree, what's gonna happen is the best way to describe it is that you learn about a lot of different topics, but it tends to be uh, shallow. Mm -hmm. So many times what happens is that the uh, students have to go into, uh, co go further into uh, graduate studies and, and so on to if they want to go into a more specific uh, field within biomedical engineering. But that said, uh, biomedical engineering is the fastest growing engineering field right now. And wow. one thing, yeah, one thing that you'll see is that many universities are start, starting biomedical engineering degrees, like UMass just started their, theirs actually after I joined. So that's why you see that I'm in the mechanical engineering department. But I, if I had been hired later, I probably would have ended up in the biomedical engineering department. Um, so it is a, a field that is growing. And um, as we, uh, as you see more research in terms, especially in the area of health, that is, um, it, it's in its, um, it, it pretty much where it starts to cover multiple fields. And what do I mean by that? Like you see a lot of the uh, research efforts right now where you have like human computer interactions, that is one field. Or for example, where you have these uh, smart devices that are uh, interacting with the human body. So one example would be, for example, the Apple Watch, where now it's taking your, uh, uh, pulse and different blood measurements. There are a lot of folks that actually are in biomedical engineering trying to come up with how can we actually make, for example, a, 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 tele, uh, a watch that could measure different molecules in your body as you're sweating? And could that uh, create a database that is that we can actually uh, see changes in your sweat, pH, or other proteins that are being released and, and be able to anticipate the beginning of the disease? Can we, uh, are we able to tell, and there's actually stories with the uh, Apple Watch where uh, they have been able to alert the, um, the person that is wearing the watch that they may be about to have a heart attack. And this yeah. person was able to go in and, and you know call doctor and say, hey, I think something's going on. They come in and they're like, yeah, you're about to have a heart attack. Wow. So the field is actually going and <laughs> heading in a very interesting uh, direction in in these uh, uh, as 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 you can see more like computer science starting to play a role on, and and the engineering and, and the technical aspects starting to overlap with the uh, healthcare uh, world. Um, it's it's actually heading in uh, a very interesting uh, direction. So good job, security. You would say? I I think so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it sounds like it. <laughs> Let's hear from some other students before we wrap up. Anybody else got questions or anything you're curious about, about um, 
Dr. Jimenez's work. Yeah. Um, hi, Dr. Jimenez. So I, I had a question on um, how you would measure the phenotype of cells. I, I remember you mentioned that earlier. I was just kind of curious about that. Sure, absolutely. Uh, so one way that you could do it is we look at, uh, at the amount of pro different proteins that the cells make. And this is what's so um, interesting about the body is that, um, you know, you have a cell and let's say in a blood vessel and you give it a stimulus. And if they're getting the uh, proper stimulus, they will, stay, they will stay healthy. But let's say you give it the wrong type of stimulus. Uh, then cells start to make proteins that are related to inflammation, related to uh, um, uh, uh, inflammation or accumulation of other proteins, or it starts, uh, mm -hmm. it, the cells in a tract for cells dying. And, um, and the way we measure that is we isolate the proteins from the cells. So you take all the cells, break them up, and then remove the proteins. And then we measure them with uh, machines that we have. And we say, all right, when you take, let's say we take some cells, let's, let's go back to the fish experiment. And we isolate bones from fish that were exercising harder, uh, bones from fish that did not exercise as hard. Then we remove the proteins and then we count uh, the amount of protein that is the same protein, but on one condition versus the other. And you say, oh, we see that under these conditions, the fish was making the cells in the fish were making more of this protein that is known to lead to disease, and that's the way um, uh, we do it. And we also do it with RNA, measuring the messenger RNA in the cells to be able to tell if the cells are adopting a uh, pro-disease or protective uh, phenotype. So, yeah. Oh wow! Thank you. Yeah, no problem. One thing I've been struck by in uh, working with scientists, just in looking at their work, but also talking with them in this sort of format is how incredibly resourceful and clever you guys are in figuring out. Um, I mean, one example I have, I can remember is uh, some fish scientists were trying to figure out what kind of populations of herring used to run up and up and down the west coast of the United, United Kingdom. But they're looking like two or 300 years ago, what, what amounts of fish were traveling in that time? So what they did is they started taking uh, core samples uh, offshore of the what's on the bottom, and they'd go down, you know, twenty feet or something, and then count back the number of years, because they knew that herring slough off uh, scales and at a certain average rate per day, mm -hmm. and that's how they determined not only how many fish there were, but where they were traveling, what like what size of the schools. Uh, that were running up and down the coast hundreds of years ago. And I could not believe how clever that was, that they just thought it through and figured it out to that extent. And I think um, that's one of the interesting challenges of being in science is that you have to use your knowledge of the actual scientific methods that you sh will have mastered at this point to kind of solve these mysteries. Um, let's let's take one more uh, one more question from a student, Juan, and then I think this is almost going on an hour, so I'd love to let you go because um, I'm sure you have other things to do. I have a question. Um, I did come on five minutes late, so I'm not sure if you answered this, but um, just how do you decide um, what uh, research topics to pursue, and like how often do you switch? Uh, projects or like or do you normally um, stay with one problem for um, a number of years or do you like branch out that kind of thing yeah that's that's a great question uh, and it's actually a challenge because if you think about it you're almost reinventing yourself every few years because you you request funding and then you address that problem ideally you solve the problem and then you have to uh, start on a new problem. And so you have to reinvent yourself um, every few years. But mainly what we do, we just follow the data. Where does the data take us? So we'll conduct experiments. And uh, many times we'll get uh, data from the experiments that uh, will answer the question. But many times there are other observations that may be relevant and we were not anticipating. 
and we will say, all right, let's let's follow that. So then you follow uh, that. And at the same time, you also have to keep reading what other scientists are publishing. And then that way you get ideas. And when you're reading many times, you're like, oh, that, that would be great. I wonder if I could use that method to ask this other question that I have in my system and, um, and then be able to address a different problem. So many times you're, it, it has a lot to do with, um, with the, uh, you having to read and staying on top of what's coming out in terms of the literature. It actually becomes harder and harder and harder because now there's so many laboratories worldwide and to be able to stay on top of everything is actually very challenging. So many times you're quickly glancing to see what other folks are doing, getting an idea, um, and then uh, in comparison to what it could have been like 40 years ago, where not all countries were conducting as much research as we see now, where many more countries are actually providing research to uh, scientists in those countries. But yeah, so you're, you're kind of reinventing yourself every few years um, and, uh, like, uh, I would have never thought that I would be working on bone and I have a project in, in bone right now. And that just happened because, you know, so serendipity that I had a student wanted to work with me and found a collaborator and we started working on that. So I anticipate that, you know, many projects like that will keep coming along in the future is just, you know, collaborations or new ideas that come up. It's like being part of a very long and interesting conversation. Yeah. Thank you. All right. How about one last question from somebody? If if there are any. It, 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 if no one has questions, I have one last point that um, you know something that if 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 you're interested, um, it, and definitely you could uh, just to see what university <clears throat> life is like. Uh, you could go to, for example, UMass, you could easily come to one of my classes or, you know, there are other classes you can just go sit and watch, see some of the topics, get an idea. Um, you, you, you can do this uh, because essentially no one's checking who's coming in and who's going. Um, so you could just come in and, and sit and, and watch a lecture. There are many uh, seminars that uh, happen at the university and are uh, freely, uh, they're, they're published, so you can find out about them, where they have uh, scientists that come from, you know, throughout the nation and sometimes from other countries and give talks on different topics. Um, and that's something that you can do as a high schooler, just to see what's happening at the university. And, and then uh, programs like this, like the program that you're involved in, this is an amazing opportunity. When I, I was in high school, I was never exposed to anything like this. So it's just amazing to, to be you know, exposed to you know, what folks are doing at the university level and just to, just to you know, maybe uh, something gets planted in your mind that can trigger other thoughts about careers and, and opportunities. That's awesome. Juan, thank you. That's very true. And that that's, that's a fantastic opportunity to head over to the university and just pop in and try to understand, like, what, what is the conversation around certain areas of research? Um, I mean, for me personally, my dad was a doctor. Uh, he wasn't working in any of these kinds of fields, but medicine and, and medical professions has always been a part of my life. And to think that we're, we're on the cusp now of an explosion of knowledge and, and ability in the human species to be able to influence the outcomes of, of health uh, is really exciting. I, so, I, I, I agree. I like uh, just one last comment because you mentioned about medicine. Yeah. I, there's a class that I, I teach in the fall and I is an engineering class. But uh, we talk about like uh, how uh, medicine and engineering come together. And one of the things that we do at the end of the semester, I take the students to, to Bay State, to the hospital, to watch a, a lot of um, uh, uh, surgical procedures. And what the students are amazed is about how much engineering goes into medicine, how much of the yeah. STEM fields go into medicine. And this is something that otherwise they will have never uh, been exposed to. And it just opens their minds. And many of them say like, oh, I want to do this. And so, yeah, exactly the point that you're making, it's, it's, you know, even if you don't go into medicine, you can influence medicine and healthcare in so many other ways that um, it's amazing opportunity right now. Yeah. 
Yeah, I would second that and say that, um, you know, as somebody who works in career development, you hear about a lot of people saying like 10 years from now, 80% of jobs will have, are gonna be jobs that don't exist right now. I don't know what the figure is, um, but I do know one thing, healthcare is always gonna be around. Yep. Human beings are still biological creatures, so we're gonna yep. need healthcare. Um, and the interface of healthcare and technology will continue to produce jobs as, for as long as any of us is gonna be alive, I think. Yep. Um, and it's an endlessly fascinating field. The, and the, the places that anybody can fit whether you like to write or whether you like to be a researcher, whether you want to be working with patients, you know, it is just, it's a wealthy field in terms of opportunities. Um, so I want to thank you for your time today, Juan. This has been fantastic. Absolutely. And I want to thank the students for coming. Um, Juan, if I get any questions, I seem especially fit for you. I might shoot them over your way. And then and I will let you know if, what happens with the STEM at work program this summer. It's still unclear whether it's going to run. Um, but as soon as I find out, I'll, I'll be in touch and we can figure okay. out if uh, hosting is something we can we can work on. Yeah, sounds great. And if any of the students at some point, they want to come visit the lab, talk to some of the students in my lab or something, you know, we can arrange something like that. that will, I'll be happy to arrange something. Excellent. Very good. All right. So thanks very much. And right. um, we'll be back in touch. All right. Wonderful. Have a good evening, yeah. everyone. Yeah. Right. Wait, wait, no question. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. Um, this summer if if um if it, the university opens will you be uh in will any internship opportunities be available with you yes absolutely that and as you stated that's the big if if the university opens right now we have been told mm -hmm. that all in-person classes are canceled and only they're only going to have summer online courses okay. so um but let's say, for example, even if a university is closed for the summer, let's say in the fall, if you wanted to pop in one day just to see um, what happens, um, you know, we could arrange something so you could come visit, visit with the students and all that. All right. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. All right. Thanks, Juan. All right. Okay. Have a wonderful Take evening. All right. Yeah, you too. Bye-bye.